What's up, world? I'm Matt Newberg from Hungary, and this is The Feed. Each episode, we'll dive into conversations with the industry insiders who are leveraging technology to shape the way we eat. On today's episode of The Feed, I sat down with Kristen Barnett and Trevor Karen of Culinary Creators Worldwide, a new agency focused on omni-channel activations for the next generation of culinary influencers. In this episode, we'll chat about the opportunities for influencers to work with brands, ghost kitchens, and tech firms to create tangible consumer experiences, the potential for grocers and restaurateurs to tap into such talent, and the key to successful partnerships in the space. We got a a double whammy here. I'm really excited to have you guys both on. Thank you so much for making the time. Um, I'd love to, to kick it off. Each of us, sorry, each of you, please give me your background. Um... Kristen, formerly of Hungry House, Trevor, formerly of Plug and Rewind, teaming up together for CCW. Tell us what you were focused on and like kind of what was the opportunity that led to you starting this company? Sure. So, um, you know, prior to starting CCW here with Trevor, I was the founder and CEO of Hungry House, a ghost kitchen company here in New York that works with culinary influencers to collaborate on menus and launch it through our ghost kitchens in New York City, selling it the food for pickup and delivery. Um, Prior to that, though, like I've been in the food tech space for a while. I was the COO of Zool, which was acquired by Kitchen United. And before that, I was uh, the director of strategic operations for Dig In, now known as Dig, a restaurant chain based here in the Northeast that does farm to table fast casual cuisine. Really, you know, where we are at now and the opportunity that we saw was fundamentally the confluence of the creator economy, the F&B industry, and the use of food technology to create new brands, to activate new products, and reach new consumers. And, you know, from my experience at Hungry House, we are working with all these incredible food influencers, these chefs who are using digital channels to engage a customer and fan base in really unique ways. And brands kept coming to me to work with us in almost more of an agency capacity. And so mm-hmm. uh, we started to work on CCW. But before I get into that, um, I'll let Trevor share the <laughs> background as well. Awesome. <laughs> That's great. Um, yeah, for the past decade, I've been an early adopter of new media channels and technologies, working with various food and beverage brands and entertainment brands helping them through marketing, creative services, and content solutions for how to, you know, grow their audience, drive loyalty with their super fans, and ultimately drive revenue. I grew up in the hospitality industry. I went to hospitality management school at Penn State, worked with Aramark for some time, and ultimately took a different path entrepreneurially. And the first iteration of Plug and Rewind was an artist management company. I was taking indie bands from Philadelphia to the national stage, doing all the booking, all the promotion, all the marketing and at the same time working at a agency in philly called fame house where we were kind of early pioneers in digital and e-commerce for the likes of the m&ms and tiestos of the world and got kind of burnt out from the artist management side and decided to diversify the portfolio to work with restaurants and chefs out of philadelphia and saw a not kind of a natural evolution for how to build fan bases, you know, the needs they had around different types of holistic marketing solutions they needed and been running the agency for a decade now and met up with Kristen months ago through Hungary. Thanks to Matt. (laughs) Thanks to Matt. That's a, I mean, I, uh, we both have been shout out to our WhatsApp group. Yeah. Shout (laughs) out to the WhatsApp group. Matt's content is not only incredible and cutting edge, but his ability to bring people together who are passionate about food and tech and the like has been amazing. So I was always fascinated with what Kristen was doing with Hungry House in terms of her positioning in the space and the ghost kitchen space and how she was doing things differently and really, really interesting. And, you know, as she mentioned, brands started coming to Hungry House to figure out ways to embed their products with the chefs on her roster and really unique ways to drive a marketing machine around these products and drops. And we kind of, you know, we, we really understood at that point that there's probably a bigger opportunity here for us to join forces and lo and behold, here we are with CCW. Love it. Love it. And obviously wanted to have you guys both on to, 
you know, because it, it's very special to me that you, you both met through our community. And to anyone who's listening who wants to be part of the community, definitely check out Hungry.tv on our site. You can sign up for a trends subscription and um, every now and then I'll, I'll drop a link for you to, to apply to get into this very exclusive <laughs> community that these two met. And I think there will be plenty more collaborations to come. So very yeah. excited by that. Um, so it's a really interesting time right now in the food tech space. Um, and I think I'd love to talk to Kristen about where you see kind of the evolution of like virtual brands and, and um, host and ghost kitchens now that you're kind of um, freeing yourself up from that world to kind of double down more on this creative side. Um, <clears throat> is Where do you think that all goes given like, you know, Uber Eats and DoorDash cracking down on a lot of those brands, kind of what we're seeing with the struggles of Nextbyte and C3 and then like what makes you so optimistic about this new approach of uh, CCW? Yeah, I think that generally what we're seeing play out is kind of what I've been trying to say all this time, which is that the quality of the brand really matters. And right now we're in a massive correction, I think, where obviously with DoorDash and Uber cracking down on the plethora of virtual brands that have been listed across those platforms, what they're actually trying to do is to create a more quality driven experience for their user base, right? And my problem always with the space is that things felt too um, like illusory. They felt very shallow in terms of the brands that were being created and what ultimately convinces consumers to give you their dollars when they're thinking about what to eat, it comes from the actual origin of the food, the story, the quality, the quality of the pictures, the ingredients, and may only come back a second time if you actually deliver on that promise. Now that's what we were doing and I feel pioneering at Hungry House, which is finding a way to leverage all of this technology to create brands that matter, stories that compel, and ultimately a company that has a huge uh, like loyal customer base that knows both Hungry House and the brands that we featured. And that focus always differentiated what we did and I think was part of the reason that so many companies came to Hungry House to collaborate with us, with our chefs, um, leveraging our kitchens and leveraging our distribution to this passionate customer base because we actually had the ability to talk very honestly and create something of quality in partnership with these companies. And so, you know, obviously you correctly called out, like there is a lot of shifts in the market in the ghost kitchen space. And now I'm evolving into more of this agency structure. And part of what that is about for me is actually just the extension of the work that we've started to do at Hungry House. Because of all this deal flow that was coming in, some is a good fit for Hungry House and distribution through our kitchens and partnership with our chefs, but some of it was not. And so what this structure actually allows us to do is to take that ethos of what we were pioneering at Hungry House and actually take it to a much, uh, like actually distribute it to a greater extent, fitting the needs of brands, working with creators in different geos, understanding different tactics and tools that can add value to a campaign that is in partnership um, between these different entities and kind of living into the fullest potential of this intersection of technology, the creator economy and the brands themselves that are looking to activate. Amazing. Yeah, I told I, I see that vision. I think let's just take a step back. And for anyone who's listening, can one of you just give us the just like the high level pitch <laughs> of culinary creators worldwide? I was yeah. afraid I wasn't going to be able to say that. It's a tongue twister. Culinary creators worldwide. Culinary, Culinary creators. Come on, man. <laughs> you can go CCW for short. Uh, <laughs> CC dubs. CC dubs. Well, CC dubs. Give us, <laughs> give us the pitch. For those who, who let's just let's just take a step back and yeah. give it. Who are you ideally targeting, and and what kind of partners you you know you're look are you looking to bring on? Fundamentally, as a company, we exist at the intersection of the creator economy, brands, and food technology. With all of our work leveraging food and beverage as the vehicle by which we carry out our activations. 
Now we really work in a full service capacity. We are both startup people. We are both really, really multidimensional in terms of what we bring to the table versus a traditional marketing background. And so what we're actually helping these brands do is everything from talent strategy and acquisition for these campaigns to the actual execution and production of these large scale events, high end content production that tells the stories of their products or the chefs that they're working with and all of the PR and influencer outreach. And so what always has been more of an operational question in the F&B space, a menu change, a new product launch, you know, developing a menu item. Now it's actually really changing the way that we look at those as these like incredible opportunities to drive a marketing campaign and do much more beyond that. Frankly, like where Trevor and I see the world going is that creators are the anchor pieces of our media ecosystem through which we can tell the most compelling stories, but they don't always have the resources to be able to do that. And so what we're looking to do is connect the dots. We have all of these resources of our collective backgrounds, our networks, our incredible talent base of collaborators that actually help us execute these projects. And we're able to amplify the ability of these creators to tell stories and to leverage food to its full extent to really captivate the minds of consumers. And modern brands are looking to connect in these ways because no longer can you just dump your money into Facebook ads and expect a return. No longer are you just putting an ad on TV and reaching your customers. Instead, it actually takes a very nuanced approach to leverage these voices in the best way that you can. Really great stuff. I, I feel like right now, like, you know, in the first iteration of the space, we see, you know, like we were just talking about, like a lot of churn and burn with these uh, brands and then like the the ones that do succeed it is kind of like the rich get richer right we have mr beast burger when it comes to food service on the cpg side it's mostly liquor driven with like kylie jenner uh 818 tequila kendall, um, kendall come on get the okay, kardashian kendall right jenner. okay <laughs> you know i'm like really an avid you know? i know you're um, an avid fan come on she would be upset and then we have like candy from Mr. Beast, right? The right. festivals. Yeah. And so what what fundamentally uh, needs to change to enable a longer tail of players uh, to succeed in this category, in these different categories? Mm. I think that what we're looking to do is actually, in terms of like a longer tail of success, I mean... Ultimately, this is through activating the right intellectual property with the right product that is going to touch the correct fan base, right? And those are the combinations that I think take deep expertise in the space to understand really what does a creator do? What are the stories that they can tell? And what, do, what does their unique audience really care about? And all of this is done well when you actually like have that combination set up for success from day one. And so we um, just executed our first project with First We Feast. It was burgers, right? We had a great chef and a TV show to pull all of this together. That's where you see the alignment uh, that, that actually makes it successful. Now, if a celebrity like Lizzo was to launch uh, with a product that contained meat that like wouldn't be the right fit because Lizzo is a vegan and very like vocal about that. And so the pairing and the strategy is I think so crucial here where you can't just have these quick one hit wonders, but really you need to think about brand creation from the very foundation of it itself. Yeah. Fascinating. So there has to be a tie between the creator and what they're actually putting out there. It can't just be some random pizza brand and some mixed up with some creator just because they like yeah. pizza. There has to be a real reason for that. I think of... fans and customers are, they smell that out. You know, I think authenticity is so critical. And if you want to maintain intimacy with the fans you've built, like Mr. Beast or the like, I can't speak to, you know, the behind the scenes of, of that particular um, product launch, but it's really about how do you authentically 
connect with that audience? And does the next product that you launch or the next experience or the next service really tie into what, what your fans are expecting? I keep thinking about like when you mentioned M M&M, like mom's spaghetti, you open up a brick and mortar <laughs> yeah. called mom's spaghetti. And it's and it's one of the the it's from the eight miles song, right? And yep. it's the first the first verse, right? Mom's spaghetti. Yep. He's nervous. <laughs> and, right? That's authentic, right? I mean I, yes. Uh it's, it's, that it's, random. Is that still, it's, it still feels it's random. Right. To me, Where it is feels that right kinda now? random yeah, though. Because right. like <laughs> Because here's the thing, right? Like, what has Eminem ever said about food besides, like, one mm-hmm. line? It's not actually about, like, his long-term relationship and, like, of cooking spaghetti and his exploration of, like, okay. every time he goes to Italy, he's eating at different pasta restaurants and talking <laughs> about it on social media. You know, like, that's not really the relationship. And those are that's kind of the nuance that we with our expertise in the like F and B space think is actually like pretty important where, you know, naturally that this creator, this celebrity really cares about this thing. Um, How do you actually help them like bring that passion to life? And those are the dream partnerships because that means they're more inclined to connect the dots on how they can best promote it. They're actually going to tell a really authentic story because again, as Trevor said, like customers, and people who are on social media, they sniff this out. They can sniff out when something is just a throwaway paid partnership collab versus a very genuine project mm-hmm. that the creator has a lot of pride in bringing to life because they believe it actually says something really important about them that they have yet to share with their followers. Mm-hmm. And that's when I think you take t- like you switch the perspective from okay, what is this campaign to like, what is this shared project that we're working on together? And how can we really lean into its full potential from like a genuine storytelling perspective? And, and what's so interesting is that in food and beverage, like traditionally restaurants have always been that, right? They've always been the story of the owners having a trip to France and you know, their grandmother's recipes from wherever they come from. That's, those are like the anchor parts of how you normally experience food and beverage. Just over recent years, it shifted a lot because we have so many new technologically driven innovations that allow us to create in a, at a scale and in a way that we've never done before. Now with Hungry House, I sought to like bring that back to some sort of origin story where we work with these real chefs who are actually finally bringing their recipes to life for their fan bases. But now we can also do it thinking about it through marketing lens as well, which is really exciting when we compare the right creators with the right product. One, one a good example. Okay, finally have a good example. Okay, okay let's my do it. Examples have been <laughs> hor- horrific. But... Um, Let's say Goop great Kitchen, example. great example, yeah. right? Because like, she doesn't, she's not a food person, right? It's a lot yeah. easier if, it, if this person already in the culinary world, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And we're going to get into Alvin, which I'm excited to talk about. But, but uh, someone like Gwen embodies like health, wellness, this whole lifestyle cult. Yeah. And is able to very successfully translate that into almost like a platform where there's now a rotisserie chicken yep. concept and there's a, I believe a bowl concept, which is like kind of the tried and true thing. So, um, yeah, that to me, like it's, it's hitting with like the, at least here in LA, you know, like the West side mom, like the yoga mom, you know, the, I, I should, I should just stop. but, um, <laughs> I'm not a culture. Tell us I'm not more a good... about the Goop Kitchen yeah, uh, customer. <laughs> yeah. It's my mom. It's my mom. My mom. My Pilates mom. Anyway. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway. Yeah. West Side, Brentwood, Santa Monica, you know. Yep. And and she's crushing it. So She's crushing. Yeah. Those kitchens are doing really well. And I think that's a perfect example of when yeah. you get that right. She knows her customer base. She is a brand that stands for food. And so when she's going to recommend something related to food, you're automatically more inclined to try it, especially if you already share the same tastes and preferences as her because yeah. you're following her, right? Yeah. So especially if you buy her jade eggs. 
<laughs> Especially if you've already purchased the Jada, you are guaranteed a super user of Goop Kitchen. <laughs> that is a great example, though, of the convergence of lifestyle and food and beverage. It's she, she hit a chord in in the right way. Okay, so let's dive in. Let's talk about the first campaign you guys have pulled off here. I think it was a success. Uh, so it was a it was a not a mashup, a collab a collabo between Hungry House. Alvin Kalen of Amboy, yeah. Quality Meats, uh, Square, Spam, and First We Feast. That's a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And you guys are the facilitators. So each of these different stakeholders want something different. W- you know, let's talk about what their needs were and then like what were the various kind of success metrics you were able to kind of deliver for them. Sure. <laughs> so... First and foremost, First We Feast was looking to create a real activation with their intellectual property for National Burger Month with the Burger Show. They were releasing Mm. five special episodes with Alvin and George Motes, the other host, and wanted to be able to bring the burgers IRL to their fan base. And so with that as like the anchor task here, everything kind of grew from that. Mm. I hungry house is an obvious ghost kitchen choice for them just based on our focus on quality and storytelling. And so we started to get to work immediately on working with Alvin to bring to life a limited menu of burgers that were directly inspired from the show. Alvin was super excited about it because he is a chef for those that don't know of Amboy quality meats, which is based in LA and he is looking to connect with a customer base and get his name out in New York as he looks to expand that brand, ideally into markets like New York in the future. And so for him, there's a lot of amazing results in like brand awareness for him that he hopes to tap into with future expansion. Now, when we went out and actually looked for our partners on this to help bring it to life, Square was an obvious fit because Hungry House uses Square as our tech platform, and Alvin mm-hmm. also uses Square as his tech platform for, mm-hmm. Al- for Amboy. And so in terms of showcasing the power of the technology, I've always been an outspoken fan of what Square has enabled Hungry House to do. And this felt like through our partnership with First We Feast, we could have an even bigger megaphone to really amplify the value of, that we found in working with them as a platform. And then finally, Spam has had a longstanding relationship with Alvin. And because of our ability to bring to life a menu, it seems like an, also an obvious option for them as a food partner, as a CPG company, to leverage this moment in time to tell the story of their product with a chef that has a genuine relationship with them who grew up eating Spam and could actually now bring this to life for customers to order across New York. So that's what we put together. It was a pretty complex deal. (laughs) Trevor's laughing because it was absolutely crazy. Say the least. In (laughs) In a very short amount of time. Yeah, insane timeline to make it all the more fun. But ultimately was really successful because we've been able to put together, you know, an event, a whole influencer campaign. We obviously have the menu running at a ghost kitchen in New York City that has created the opportunity for thousands of people to access these burgers. And um, all of these brands ultimately have something IRL, which is so special when you think about the direct relationship you can have with a customer through that channel. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I kind of want to zoom in a little bit more on that because I think that's what I think that's what what's really unique here. It's that this is a full 360 omni-channel campaign uh, and something I've been thinking about a lot, which is, you know, these kind of concentric circles of engagement, right? You have, you know, probably a very small but very highly engaged audience that's able to, like, show up and attend and actually consume a burger on-premise, right? You have a wider net of people that you can service through the Hungry House Ghost Kitchen that would see this on, maybe they'll watch First We Feast on YouTube and they say, oh, I'm in the delivery radius or I, I could pick this up. And they'll go and consume it that way. And then there's probably a wider network that's just watching it, salivating and saying, well, maybe I'll, I'll get up out to Amboy uh, when I hit up to Panga Social uh, <laughs> in uh, Canoga Park. It's the Valley of L.A. for those who don't know. 
or their location in downtown LA. But there's all these kinds of broader rings that you're kind of engaging with uh, to very varying degrees. So talk to us about why that very rich, uh, limited, kind of like exclusive um, engagement is so important, IRL. I think coming out of, you know, what, in the world we are now, coming out of COVID, it really is an omni-channel world. And I would add to the before point where, you know, we were on the front end producing tons of content around the storytelling, videos, photos, the branding. So getting people excited about this. And for the IRL, for this particular campaign, we in some ways see it as a marketing vehicle, another way to generate demand, another way to generate hype around this. So, you know, when you look at what you can, you have people that are coming to the event that are consuming you know, the food who are engaging industry tastemakers, press, influencers, etc. You're also able to generate tons of user generated content yeah. from the event that's, you know, can be used post active, you know, during the activation throughout the whole life cycle of the activation, we are able to produce dozens of pieces of premium content. So it, it, it's being in real time and that int intimacy of the event is so critical. And then also all the kind of evergreen content we can actually continue to flush out. So the ability to activate in real life is, I think, critical when you're looking at dropping a new product or experience or any type of offering. It's just it's it's a layer that I think is so important. Yeah, I like what you're saying about the the evergreen aspect of IRL events living on. They're not ephemeral. They're not this like kind of thing that exists just at these couple hours in the evening. It's something that is captured, shared, and hits a wider audience. Again, following that kind of concentric circles of engagement. Um, I need a better way to brand that. This is why I don't <laughs> work in, it, in marketing. Yeah, and what's, yeah. what's interesting too, Matt, about this is because of the synergy amongst all the stakeholders where we you know on the front end, we did so much alignment about what their needs were and what the opportunities were, is that to Kristen's point earlier, you know, we're not, they're not, paying Facebook or, you know, the rising digital cost of all these things that, you know, you have now cross pollinating fan bases all towards foodies and passionate kind of food lovers across New York who are part of Square's fan base, part of Spam's fan base, part of Albin's. And because of how we set this up in the alignment on the front end, everyone's sharing this content. So the reach becomes 10 X from what it would have been. Otherwise it's, and, and that's another interesting piece to bringing people together, both digitally and experientially with this. I mean, it's very clear to me that this is generating a lot of awareness, but I'm just wondering kind of, are there any, is there anything you can share as far as like results that you've seen from this? You know, did, did, did Square sign up new customers from it? Did um, Amboy get, you know, I guess you, we have data on Hungry House um, purchases. Yeah. Um, did Spam see a lift in sales in New York? I don't know what they would be looking for, <laughs> but you know, I guess like, can we zoom yeah. in a little bit more into the, into like the, the funnel there and, and see like, what are, what are all these parties really getting out of it and justifying it so that, you know, they can continue to invest in this. Yeah. Their main goals, you know, from Square and Spam's perspective was primarily the impressions generated from this and increasing their like basically brand awareness in the market and with specific audiences. Square being very focused on Gen Z as well as restaurateurs. And so, all of the Hungry House driven content around how we use the platform has been really powerful for them, as well as helping them actually launch their Android KDS, which is like their great, their amazing new screens and, you know, how you can actually use Square on, on Android, which has been awesome to actually trial that product and, and share it out. And Spam, similarly, you know, really looking to connect with the multicultural fan base. Um, and they're looking to tell the story of the product and how you can cook it. And all of the pictures of this spam melt being blasted out from all of the people who attended this <laughs> event um, made for really great success. Obviously, in terms of the data that we have access to, it's all centered around Hungry House and the performance there, which has been absolutely incredible. Obviously, I can't share any hard numbers, but it has been our most successful season change yet. And we saw in our first week overall lift on our retail sales of 45%, which is massive, um, like truly, truly massive. And that's like not just of the burger category, that is overall retail sales. 
Um, we'd had a prior burger brand on the menu and this also did like basically 2.5 X to our burger sales. So this was not just like, Oh, our burger fans are here and they like burgers and we launched this menu. It was a lot of new customers and a lot more interest in our burgers. And so we've been really thrilled at the results here. And, um, obviously think it speaks to just the power of having the right combination of the right intellectual property, the right partners sharing this out. And then obviously the design of the campaign overall, as Trevor mentioned with the content up front and how we drip that out all within this, a brand identity that we created for the launch itself. Awesome. Well, it sounds like a win-win. Uh, just real quickly, what is a spam melt? What, what is... <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's a slice of spam, like basically grilled until it's super crispy. Uh, we use American cheese, these spicy cucumbers, the Amboy spicy mm -hmm. mayo, and mm -hmm. serve it on a sesame seeded bun. I know those buns. Okay, very cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and no worth comment. noting, and worth noting, Matt, that all the cocktails of the event were served in spam cups. So that was oh, that was that cool. was a, a hit beyond belief. That's yeah. cool. I went to an Omsom spam collab um, actually at my office in LA, which was pretty cool. Um, they had the spam yeah. masubi. Yep. All right, very so. Cool. Back to business. Um, <laughs> so if we look at, I, th I think we're all aligned that this is super early innings right now for culinary creators. Like if we think about the current set of tools that they have to monetize, we're barely scratching the surface. So I guess like, where do you see like the current set of, you know, the, the various monetization strategies that they have at their disposal, w w at their disposal, where do you see that currently working? Where do you see like, potential opportunities like what do you wish would exist for some of these creators that doesn't currently mm. great question um i'll start and then uh trevor can jump in on this you know generally coming out of hungry house originally like you know the whole idea here is that exactly what you're saying matt Culinary creators, these culinary voices that are building businesses online on social media need more options to bring to life their product and their products make money when the, and make money when they're not considering a traditional restaurant based career path. Right. And so with Hungry House, we gave them licensing deals. So they actually earn royalties from their the sales of their menu items through our kitchens. But that is capped. We could only work with a certain amount of creators, right? At any given time, we can only change the menu so frequently. And so what's exciting here is I think that we get to engage in the full spectrum of opportunities here. Obviously, there are um, their ability is like they can launch a cookbook, but that's a lot of work. Multi-year project, a lot of, lot of work. There's and too not many cookbooks out there. And there's a lot many. of cookbooks too. <laughs> yeah. I got too many Noma cookbooks that are just sitting on my shelf. And so how do you like really build a business? Um, there's the brand partnerships and collabs, which could be like one-off content creation, sponsored content, like making a recipe with a product. But ultimately we th are thinking about how we can create an ecosystem that extends far beyond that. I'm really interested in, and obviously this building out of Hungry House is like where we can get them into more licensing and royalty deals where their intellectual property is shared in partnership with really like-minded brands. So co-creation wherever possible and allowing them to really tell their story uh, and, and genuinely launch something that matters to them. Where I think there's like a really big gap and I think it's still being figured out is like the creator packaged goods because you do need a lot yeah. of capital and a lot of resources to actually launch a product. Because And that's ultimately yeah. a CPG company, right? Which is not the actual career path of a creator. They are building content, telling stories and connecting with fans. And so how do you actually set up structures that allow them to launch products that their customers want? And that is a big gap that I think is done through really thoughtful partnership. Trevor, mm -hmm. I'll hand it off to you for the other ideas. Yeah, no, I think all those are really salient, uh, especially the co-created products with brands and, and the ability to kind of, as, as you said, the, the licensing factors and the limited edition drops. And I think equally as important, you know, we talk about other ways to monetize and who knows where social goes with this, but 
I think it's equally as important to look at the indirect paths to monetization and looking at those social platforms in that way. And if you look at the great brands that are constantly putting out content and building trust with their audience and using these channels as, you know, a consistent media channel and then looking at these other ways to monetize, that's how I see, at least for the next few years, it continuing to go. So going back to like the infrastructure, like in this idea of like integrated commerce, um, yeah. which is like I see something on social media, on TikTok, Instagram, whatever. It's a, it's maybe it's on the grocery shelf or maybe it's something I can order to be delivered to my house as like a hot meal. What do you think is the role of ghost kitchens in this or host kitchens? Um, and then like, how do you think this might work, you know? on the grocery shelf I, the grocery yeah. shelf is impossible to crack right there's no real easy way to do this but mm -hmm. how, how will that open up as well i think that there are not everything needs to be distributed through a ghost kitchen or a host kitchen although in many ways that has been a potential workaround from like other more difficult paths to actually get a product to someone really quickly and obviously there was a lot of excitement with the quick uh, ultra fast grocery delivery mm -hmm. boom of 2021, which has turned unfortunately into mm -hmm. somewhat of a bust, I would say. Yeah. But really like where we see it going is that the creators themselves are an incredible, incredible marketing channel for these products. And it really does take pretty thoughtful construction of a direct pathway for their followers to actually access those products. So now, like, how do you actually help creators, you know, have a link and then, you know, push the customer through really easy purchasing flow, right? Are they linking to Uber Eats or are they linking to a landing page that says, how do you want to get this? And you can click Uber Eats if you have Uber One or you can go to DoorDash if that's your preferred platform, you know? I think there are really interesting apps that are um, being developed that are focused on integrated commerce. Um, but at the same time, I do think that you always have to focus on where the customers are, which are on Instagram and TikTok. That is where they are following people or on Pinterest, right? And so how do you bring the transaction as close as possible into that platform, which is ultimately going to be the easiest way to connect the customer to whatever the product is. And I think that that's the question that's being answered or should be answered when you think about um, think about the vision for what the future of commerce is. And I, I, I would be surprised if like Instagram and TikTok aren't continuing to invest in understanding how to do just that. Yeah, I'm seeing like when I launched TikTok the other day, they, they immediately put me into the shop streaming or yep. whatever that's called. So like, you know, call to actions to buy products etc yeah and it's only a matter of time before that exists for delivery apps so i'm just curious like if it's not ghost yeah. kitchens or host kitchens like who is fulfilling this like is it like how will it get to the consumer i think it's a great question i mean ultimately what we are focusing on is potent is actually like somewhat disaggregating that question we're looking at how we can create real moments in time that tell fantastic stories to get people excited about the product itself, leveraging these create these culinary creators, these voices. But then also we are ensuring that when we do that, we are basically calibrating it to the geo that we're looking to focus on and enabling channels that probably already exist for our customers. We want to, again, make that as easy as possible for them to transact, for them to convert and are looking to build into those constraints and while also then maximizing the marketing value of the voices themselves. I don't think that we're here to really pontificate on like who's going to build the full integrated commerce, ghost kitchen, grocery delivery behemoth that <laughs> maybe should exist. But I think that what actually we're going to see is a lot of the existing entities evolving their product offering, evolving their operations and their tech stacks to be able to get closer to that. And that's what I'm watching because I think that the companies themselves that grew out of the 2020, 2021 food tech boom were building from the ground up 
with inflated valuations, too much overhead, and often often ignorant of the fundamentals in whatever line of business they were in, whether it be grocery delivery or ghost kitchens and the nature of running an actual profitable F&B establishment. And so now in this calibration, we're looking at, and then where I think the opportunity is, is for who are the grocery chains that are actually innovating and building partnerships with Instacart and finding really unique creator partnerships to maybe have a section of their shelves that are dedicated to these creators that might anchor products right. or promote a certain program and being prepared to actually facilitate that type of funnel and that type of customer journey. And that's what I'm really excited about. It's the brands yeah. that are changing the way they're doing things. It's the existing right. companies that have the infrastructure and are looking to now evolve it. Yeah, a lot of light bulbs went off like when you said that because I think I see Foxtrot kind of trying to do this right. They've um, they're obviously yeah. have the 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 tech wherewithal to do that. Um, you see, like going back to Lizzo, Lizzo partnering with Instacart to try to curate her own set of like favorite grocery her her basic her shopping list that you could shop at any grocery store. It's just yeah a layer of data on top of that existing marketplace yep. and. I'm seeing a new thing in LA called Fatty Mart. You should check <clears throat> that out. I'll check uh, it out. It's a restaurateur that just started this really cool, like 5,000 square foot kind of market that does also prepared prepared food really well. And mm. I think they're really trying to build it into like a community center. And, and he's really active on TikTok and Instagram and thoughtful about what he's curating. So I, I totally see that. Um, thinking about all like, kind of the stack that you guys have used to, to pull off the first campaign and what you're going to plan to use, at least for the pres presumable future. Uh, is there anything you can share on like, just like the various platforms you're using, the tools you're using, some of the partnerships that you, that you plan to, um, to, to lean on when it comes to executing these campaigns? Yeah, ultimately, we're building an ecosystem around culinary creators that anchors our ability to execute these omnichannel campaigns. And so this ecosystem is fundamentally driven by both of our backgrounds in the F&B and hospitality space. And coming from food tech, I think it provides a really, really differentiated approach to our campaigns vis-a-vis -vis a normal experiential marketing agency or PR agency whoever you might try to traditionally work with for when you're thinking about a creator driven product launch. And so what we're doing like is who is going to be our national virtual brand partner that can help us access like third party platform based national distribution mm. when there is an opportunity to drive that type of campaign who are going to be our local and regional players that can help us launch out in LA or that could help us launch in the Southeast who are the CEOs of the various restaurant groups that we think would be open-minded to creator-based you know, special menu items and mm. drops that could be ultra compelling for their fan base. Um, and beyond that, you know, who are the people that we know are incubating CPG brands? Who are the distributors? Who are the large food service companies like an HMS host or an Aramark or a Sodexo that could also give us access to airports or college campuses. Mm -hmm. And beyond that too, thinking about real estate partners that might be interested in activating parts of their real estate portfolio for a short term basis or even potentially something longer term. And we could facilitate some sort of deal or partnership that would actually allow them to access this type of intellectual property. And so that's been our number one focus, you know, as we think about bringing a really differentiated ecosystem that's going to power a unique set of abilities for these food brands, for these tech companies that are looking to play in the culinary creator space. And that's been most important to us. Ultimately, like the social media tracking tools and, you know, mm -hmm. calendar planning, all of that's pretty like, I don't, like undifferentiated and ultimately where we think the differentiation lies is our unique understanding of this ecosystem that your regular agency would just simply not have access to. Really fascinating. I'm just creating a market map in my mind of like, you know, you're this, lay this layer that spans across a ton of, it's a huge surface area yeah. of things. And um, it's all, very intricate and I totally see that like the same way that 
I'm on, you know, boots on the ground trying to figure this stuff out. You guys are there too. And there's no way that anyone who's just in the traditional marketing world is going to be able to hop into the restaurant and, and grocery space and CPG space and just understand it from day zero. It's just, uh, there's a lot of complexity there. Yeah. You know, Matt, we go way back, <laughs> back in like the, the New York, like hearing on ghost kitchens in like oh, 2018, boy. even, you know, <laughs> fight the we, power, <laughs> fighting the good fight since day one, you know, yeah. and, and it's that type of deep institutional knowledge of how these companies are created, how they are, um, motivated, how they're actually building their business and what's most important that I think is uh, a secret sauce of, of what we can do. And, and I mean, ultimately, what better marketing medium is there than food and beverage? People ultimately want to eat, they want to drink, and they want to get together to do both of those things. And so if we can kind of u- leverage this universal truth in such a unique and diversified capacity, that's really ultimately the future that we're building with our company. Well, wow. yeah, it's so untapped as far as like this as a medium itself, right? I mean, yeah. you have restaurants that just want you to eat at their restaurant, but what brands are out there where it makes sense for them to tell a story through food, right? There's yeah. other non-food brands that could potentially play a role here, right? 100%. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm thinking like into it, QuickBooks uh, <laughs> Cafe. <laughs> Just it's gonna be a <laughs> rager. <laughs> no, but I'm like I'm going back to the rest, the National Restaurant Association, yeah, uh, conference. Um, and everybody there was trying to be a glorified cafe. It's just <laughs> funny because it's like you have the people from Otter, which is Cloud Kitchens, like wearing smocks, right, <laughs> wearing aprons, and like you have. You know, Square created a cafe where they're like giving you merch through their. All the orders are coming through a pickup, their pickup platform, like the or, online ordering, and then it goes to the KDS, and you can see like, oh, this Kristen ordered a sweatshirt and a mug, you know, and it's just like, this is way too much. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it it totally speaks to what we're saying, like F and B. And the way that you receive service and interact with it is fundamentally at its most basic level captivating. Mm. And that is why everyone is putting on the apron, right? And doing the dance because you see that and you think about, oh, someone's going to come and serve me. I'm going to talk to someone. I'm going to receive something. And versus like if you are... Like, I mean, it's different even than music, although that's similar too. you're going to receive a show and entertainment. And that is why that also can be a really powerful marketing channel, because it's ultimately captivating your attention. And so that's where we plan to do that. But just with this really unique specialty and like kind of deep knowledge of the entire ecosystem here that has a ton of possibilities. Yeah, I mean, have you guys seen these partnerships with these chef it's like chef is making a trend is coming back now. And it's like, you know, these big uh, restaurants are partnering with like fashion. Yeah. Brands. It's fascinating. Yeah. It's a convergence yeah. of lifestyle and food and beverage. Absolutely. It's just the beginning of it. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, I'm going to stop making bad <laughs> analogies for every, for the sake of everyone. <laughs> I'm clearly living under a rock uh, under one very specific rock. I'm currently living under the tip. The, the Earl Enterprise Topanga social basement trying to figure out how this is all going to work. But um, let's look at the next let's look at the next decade plus or the next decade. What what are you excited about uh, as far as what these various brands and culinary culinary creators are going to have at their at, at their fingertips to enable them to thrive? And maybe paint us a picture of what an activation might look like in the year 2030. Ooh, 2030. <laughs> <laughs> Figure, figuratively speaking. I think, you know, when, when you look at <sighs> that, I think the channels will change. It's, it's hard to predict what will happen in 10 years from now. But at the end of the day, it's how can creators and brands get closest to their customers and their fans? I think the more seamless, the more convenient, the more experiential, and to the point earlier, all the different companies that are looking and are building these types of technologies that we are able to sit on top of and enable activations on top of, 
everything will lean towards who can get closest to the customer and everything will lean towards who can most, you know, authentically connect with that customer. And so an Activision 2030 can look crazy, but I think it'll be down to that humanization at the end of the day. So I, uh, it could be robots, a human robot. <laughs> <laughs> Not, not not so many, so many yeah. robots, I think, but more kind of like probably. I think when looking at specifically the creator space, it's the community based technology that would allow them as an individual um, or potentially with a team behind them to really engage in like deep and easy community marketing tactics with drop based mm -hmm. commerce that allows them to engage with their followers mm -hmm. potentially in partnership with brands or just even alone like releasing merch so it's like looking at how you could have a really easy system like community for the text message marketing but then also combined with the ability to have like a shopify but set up even mm -hmm. easier more directly potentially through your instagram that allows you to connect with your followers and so making commerce even closer to social media because that's where the eyeballs are um, is going to be really critical here. And I think that the communication loops are going to get even like tighter, quicker and easier. Um, and uh, generally more like multidimensional as we see the rise of a lot of creators and comedians running their own discord channels and continuing to interact with people in closer and closer kind of context. You mentioned Discord, but you forgot to mention <laughs> blockchain. Yes. I so you're telling, you're telling me that Fly, Fly Fish Club <laughs> isn't the future. Listen, this, listen. A blockchain restaurant. They're, they're, yes? They're, they're out there. Restaurant I think group. you have plenty of other podcasts on this subject, Matt. But <laughs> I generally think that ultimately all of the web3 dao based work that's been happening dao is nft based whatever it is is ultimately an act of community building yeah. and the web3 communities are incredibly close knit and it was really easy to motivate them especially during the pandemic with everyone sitting at home around certain projects and so when i mean like community based technologies it's kind of built on that but it's assuming that not everyone's going to have the wallets and the architecture. And right. I don't even know that that's going to come to fruition by 2030, just generally with all the financial instability that we've witnessed now over the last 12 to 18 yeah. months. And so um, I think it's the community based technology, but it can be sans blockchain because ultimately communities are created everywhere. Right. And um, the easier that it is for people to participate and engage and feel like they're a part of something, the better, the better for the follower, but the, also the better for the creator too. Oh, man, well said. Um, okay, well, this has been really fun. Uh, I had a lot of fun. So <laughs> if people want to get in touch with you, let's say they work at any of these companies that we've we mentioned in, in any of those capacities, what's the best way to reach out, plug away whatever website or email or 800 number that you guys want? 1-800-CULINARY. No, um... <laughs> Uh, people can find us at culinarycreators.com or connect with us on LinkedIn um, directly. We'd love to talk about any of the opportunities, obviously, here that we see um, in terms of our ability to partner with creators and great brands. So culinarycreators.com. Okay, awesome. Trevor, any final closing notes? Because <laughs> it's so. frozen. I can't see any of the reactions. It's been frozen for 30 <laughs> minutes. I'm like, how do I react to this? So painful. <laughs> so I'm sitting back. Uh, no, I, I think we're so excited about what we're building in the ecosystem in which we talked about in terms of the convergence of brands and creators and the tech that can enable all this. So really appreciate you bringing us on, that and for being the kind of the, the person that brought us together. So looking forward to the future. Awesome. Well, yeah, it warms my heart that, that you guys were able to make something happen out of this. So congratulations. I'll be following closely. And uh, thanks yeah. uh, again for coming on. Thank you. Show.
Thanks for tuning in. If you like what you hear, please hit subscribe wherever you're listening to this podcast. And if you're curious to get a firsthand look at the cutting edge of food and tech, check out Hungry.tv. That's Hungry with No You, where you can join in on live conversations like these or sign up for the free weekly newsletter.